afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you once again to the second episode of the first Cebu Cancer Institute webinar series, a multidisciplinary cancer care a treatment continuum. For this afternoon session, we have one speaker to discuss about the surgical management of breast cancer. To introduce our speaker, we would like to welcome our moderators for this afternoon's webinar. Our first moderator, is a graduate of Cebu Doctors University College of Medicine. She finished her residency training in general surgery at Cebu Doctors University Hospital. She had her fellowship training in breast surgery at National University Hospital in Singapore. And she's currently practicing a practicing consultant at Perpetual Soccer Hospital, Cebu Doctors Hospital and Changhua Hospital. She's Dr. Francis Marion de la Serena. For our second moderator, he is an IM medical oncologist, a graduate of Cebu Institute of Medicine. He had his residency training in internal medicine at Perpetual Soccer Hospital. He had his fellowship in medical oncology at the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. He also had his master in clinical medicine at the University of Philippines in Manila. Currently, he is the vice president of Philippine Society of Medical Oncology and the PSMO Governing Council Head for Research. He's also the training officer of the Department of Internal Medicine at the Pretzel Soccer Hospital, and is currently the chairman of Mercy Cancer Care Center. He's Dr. Arnold John Husson. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Francis? Our speaker for this afternoon is the head of the breast services at National University Hospital. She is an assistant professor of the Yung Lu Lin School of Medicine, National University of Singapore. She has a doctorate degree in neuroendocrinology and her area of expertise is oncoplastic breast surgery. Let's all welcome Dr. Chan Ching Wan. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this series of webinars um, about oncology management. My name is Ching. I'm one of the breast surgeons at the National University Hospital of Singapore. And I just wanted to share a few updates in breast cancer treatment that have actually made a real difference in how we manage patients in our institution. And so, as we all know, breast cancer management has changed quite drastically in the past two, two decades um, and the main outcomes that we see are better survival rates, patients are living longer and the patients that we have actually uh, sent for new adjuvant chemotherapy first um, do are seeing, we are seeing increasing rates of pathological complete response. And because of these two scenarios, it has led to certain changes in how we then plan treatment for patients in where we are. Okay. Uh, we do know that treatments do result in certain long-term side effects and the impact of these on patients' quality of life, as certainly as survival improves, becomes increasingly significant. And so everywhere there is a move towards aiming for lesser treatment or the minimal treatment that is necessary for maximal oncological control. Uh, one of the ways to do this is to detect disease early and so screening should always be a regular phenomenon that happens in order to detect it when it is still very very curable. And but for patients who have or present with more advanced disease we are hoping that with with proper planning and with adequate um, tailoring of treatments for each patient, we can actually still aim for less radical treatment in some of them who have good responses. So the traditional management has always been to start with an operation because this allows us to adequately stage patients and gives us an idea what adjuvant treatment is necessary for her. <clears throat> 
However, as research has progressed, uh, we do understand cancer biology a lot better. And so now we know that certain cancers will or should receive chemotherapy as part of their management, particularly cancers of the triple negative and HER2 positive subtypes. Uh, and so patients like these, even in early breast cancer stages, i.e. stage one or stage two, we are also sending for chemotherapy upfront because this does result in better disease control. Um, for locally advanced breast cancers, um, and so these are patients who present with cancers larger than five centimeters, uh, and there are palpable, potentially matted lymph nodes in the axilla, but no other metastatic disease seen on metastatic workups. These patients actually routinely do much better if you get systemic treatment in first. And not only does it cover and, sorry, and control micrometastatic disease, which is undetectable at the time of screening, it also allows the primary breast cancer to downsize, which makes operating and removing the cancer with clear margins much more easy um, and also allows, in some patients, breast conservation. Um, okay. And so we will just, I'm having, I have two main groups that I'm focusing on. So early breast cancer, first of all, and then after that, a little bit in advanced breast cancers. Um, so the first topic that I'm covering would just be margins. And this is just to go through that def margins have finally got been defined as what is a good negative margin. And for invasive breast cancer, this is now defined as no cancer seen at the inked margins on pathological specimens. And so as long as we see this at the time of um, final histology, there is no need to go back to re-excise margins for cancers. In DCIS, we actually like a little bit more because there is propensity for skipped lesions in, in this particular condition. And so the margins for an, what constitutes a negative margin is two millimeters for DCIS. Okay. And so moving on, the next update that I just wanted to highlight is how the axillary management has changed. Um, and so I think all of us do sentinel node biopsies. Um, we, and this is done in patients who are, are at the early stages. So they are clinically node negative and they have small cancers. Um, the usual way of finding it is to use a dual tracer method. However, many institutions use single tracers and that is also acceptable. It's just that when you audit yourselves, you have to make sure that you are able to detect the sentinel node by sentinel node in at least 90% of your patients and false negative rates when the nodes are assessed at frozen sections should be under 5%. And by and large, at the moment, what we normally practice has been a full clearance after the detection of a positive node. Okay. However, there were a few studies and certain findings when we looked at our sentinel node biopsies that suggested that possibly this practice also should change. And these are a few trials that actually initiated the change and showed us that axillary clearances for patients with positive disease is not always necessary. Um, so the Z11 first of all, this was a trial that was designed simply because after the NSABP B04 results, which were published, and this actually is a very old study and follow up for this particular one is now hitting 20 to 30 years. Um, and this particular study showed that axillary dissection did not make a difference to overall survival. And then the second observation that also led to the Z11 study was that positive lymph nodes are usually the only positive nodes in these patients who had axillary clearances as well. And so it actually led to a question as to whether could we leave patients, sorry, could we uh, avoid a full clearance in patients who only had minor involvement of the nodes um, in the axilla. And so patients were selected on the basis of um, good cancers, good biology, and who were low risk. Uh, 
M. And so this was T1, T2, and clinically not N0. However, the median size at react section was 17 millimeters. And so most patients who, had, who were recruited into this trial had T1 disease. All patients underwent breast conservation. And they were, and only eligible patients were those who had one or two positive lymph nodes at the sentinel node biopsy. So patients were had a sentinel node biopsy performed, and if they were only found to have one or two positive lymph nodes, they were then randomized on table to receive a full dissection, or they had or no or no further surgery. All patients then had whole breast irradiation, and the vast majority, ninety seven percent of them, had systemic therapy. And this was either a combination of chemotherapy and endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy only. Um, and so if we look at the results from the study, uh, of note as well is that at least one third, but almost half of patients who were recruited only had micrometastatic disease in the lymph nodes. In this particular, and so in the group that then went on to have a complete dissection, it was noted that additional 27% had more positive lymph nodes. And so we would assume that in the group that only had sentinel nodes, there would be an equivalent number of patients with positive nodes left behind. Um, and so with this in mind, one would expect that if clearing the axilla made a difference, we would expect higher local recurrence rates and certainly higher axillary recurrence rates. But if you look at the final outcomes that were analyzed, local recurrence rates, 10 year overall survival, 10 year disease free survival were equivalent between the groups. Axillary recurrences were a little bit more be in the group that did not have a full dissection. However, the difference is not huge and it wasn't statistically significant. The next trial that also then assessed whether it was possible to leave positive notes, sorry, to omit a full dissection in presence of positive notes was the IBCSG. They were a little bit more conservative. They only accepted patients who had micromets in the lymph nodes, um, but they did allow patients who had mastectomy to also be recruited into the trial. And so patients who were found to have micrometastatic disease in lymph nodes were then randomized to having a complete dissection or just observation. Uh, the demographics of the patients recruited, uh, a lot of them were T1 cancers. Many of them were ER positive, but a significant number although minority, did have grade 3 disease. 90% of them had radiation because this was the proportion of patients with breast conservation. And in patients who had axillary dissections, an additional positive lymph node was found in 13%. Again, in the flunked in the outcomes, which was um, five-year follow-up, uh, there was no difference in overall survival or disease-free survival, but there was still also a little bit more axillary recurrences in the patients who did not have a full dissection. So this final study, which is the Amaros study, um, recruited again patients to assess whether it is safe to leave the rest of the axilla alone. However, they did not com they compared a dissection versus radiation. And so in this, this was actually two therapeutic arms versus one arm without treatment. 65% um, of the patients were not negative on, sorry. So the way this study was, con was conducted was they recruited many, they recruited patients and only patients who were biopsy positive were then randomized to have a completion dissection or randomized to axillary radiation. The mean tumor size on resection was 17 to 18 mm. Um, so again, T1 tumors. 80% of patients had breast conservation and so they also had whole breast irradiation. 90% of patients went on to have systemic therapy. Um, in all cases, there was an average of one to three lymph nodes removed. 60% um, of them were for micrometastatic disease and 30% for micrometastatic disease. Um, 
and in the completion in the group that had a dissection, 32% were found to have additional positive lymph nodes, and on average, uh, seven of seven, almost eight percent of them had actually more than four positive lymph nodes. So, and again, disease-free survival and overall survival was the same in both groups, and um, in the group that had axillary RT. They also did find there was a slight increase in the number of axillary recurrences as compared to those who had a full dissection. But again, the results were not very different statistically. And so nowadays, if you were to, how would this affect your practice? Um, this is one possible workflow which you may want to implement in your institution. Um, so for patients who come with early breast cancer, you can first assess the lymph nodes and this can be either by imaging, so ultrasounds, uh, this is also a good way, or you can actually do a biopsy such as a FNA of the lymph node that looks suspicious. And so if these were negative, you could then proceed with a formal sentinel node at the time of surgery. Okay. However, if on imaging or on FNA you find that the lymph nodes are positive for cancer, you can then uh, send the patient down two different routes of treatment. The first is that if you do suspect significant nodal disease, then these patients actually should be sent for new adjuvant chemotherapy. However, if patients refuse chemotherapy up front, then they would just go straight to an axillary dissection in the situation when primary surgery is performed. Okay. However, at the time of... Um, okay, so that's for the first case. If, however, you find that even though the lymph nodes appear positive, but you think that the disease burden is still relatively low, and so it, the patients fit the criteria for either the Z11 or the MROS or the IBCSG trials, then you can still elect to perform sentinel node biopsies for these patients. And then if you prove that you can only detect one or two positive lymph nodes and not more than that, then they, you may still be able to omit axillary clearances in some of these patients with positive nodes. And so the next area that I want to um, talk about is actually how preoperative chemotherapy has changed management for our patients in NUH. Uh, so there are several indications for preoperative neoadjuvant chemotherapy that we use in NUH. The first, of course, is if you have inoperable breast cancer, where you cannot get clear margins and or you are worried that you may leave positive margins behind at the time of surgery. However, in the group of patients who are still operable, um, we still actually push neoadjuvant chemotherapy if they have HER2 positive disease or they have triple negative disease. And certainly in these particular diagnoses, if cancer is larger, more than um, five centimeters in size, or they appear to have significant nodal disease as well. Um, the other possible patient groups who may also be considered for neoadjuvant chemo are those who have a large primary uh, relative to their breast size who would like to be able to try to have breast conservation at the end. And the last group that we would also actively consider for this are patients who do have very positive node disease, but might be rendered node negative after treatment. And again, these groups also fall into the HER, patients with HER2 positive disease and or triple negative breast cancers. So, so as when we, in going over all the evidence, these are a few benefits that preoperative chemo offers to most patients. Firstly, it does make breast conservation easier and more patients are eligible for breast conservation if they've gone through neoadjuvant chemotherapy first. It can, of course, make inoperable tumors operable. It provides important prognostic information for the patient because we can actually see how well patients are responding to chemotherapy. And this is especially important for patients with very aggressive cancers like the triple negs or the HER2 positive. And it's largely because if we do find residual disease after chemotherapy at the time of surgery, these patients 
act, do benefit from further adjuvant chemotherapy and it does result in better survival and lower rates of local recurrences. Um, of course, if you can see that patients are not responding well to the initial line of chemotherapy agents, it actually allows you to modify them and change them to something which may bring about a better response rate. Um, and the final point is that, especially in younger patients, um, it does allow time for genetic testing uh, adequate genetic counselling so that patients can then make a choice as to whether they also would want preventive surgery for the unaffected breast. And so these are a few opportunities that chemotherapy upfront also allows. Firstly, in patients that have good response, we may be able to avoid axillary clearances because if they've been downstaged to node negative disease and we can prove it on the central nodes alone, then it is safe to actually leave the rest of the axilla behind. Um, it may result in some modifications of the radiation because if you have node negative disease, after chemotherapy, there is a chance you may be able to also avoid radiation for these patients. Um, the other thing, of course, it is a very good platform in which to try new therapies, either new chemotherapy agents or uh, immunotherapy agents. And then it is also a very good place to try and work out what are potential predictive biomarkers for these agents in order to see whether it actually affects how we can choose patients in the future for treatment. Um, and finally, one of the biggest advantages I feel is that achieving PCR in patients actually does decrease the chance of a second breast cancer event by a significant amount. Uh, and patients who derive the greatest benefit from this particular result are those who have triple negative disease and HER2 positive disease. Uh, and in patients who have had a PCR, adjuvant chemotherapy after surgery does not make any difference to prognosis and so there is no need for further treatment or other further chemotherapy in patients who have already achieved a pathological complete response. And so specifically then, if we had a patient who presented with her two positive disease on a core biopsy and it was at least five millimeters in size or bigger, all these patients will be sent for systemic therapy upfront. Um, we can get very good PCR rates, uh, especially when you administer the dual anti-HER2 therapy. Um, that although can be quite expensive and not many patients in Singapore actually can afford it. And so, but even trastuzumab alone is already a very good outcome. Um, and then patients after they've completed this course are then operated on. And if we do find residual disease, we know that they will also benefit from adjuvant TDM1, which is an antibody drug conjugate with the trastuzumab antibody. And this also increases the um, overall survival and disease-free recurrences for patients. And so it is a good, well, if we know that their cancer did not respond completely, we know that they would benefit and so this would be given to them at the subsequently. It's similar for the triple negative breast cancers. So as long as there is a five millimeter cancer, we will give them new adjuvant chemotherapy up front. Again, PCR rates are in the range of 40 to 50 percent. And um, those with residual disease after chemo will benefit from additional adjuvant keep cytobine. And it is important to find these patients because if we operated on them first and only then gave adjuvant chemotherapy, we would not know whether they need a keep cytobine or not. And that and this also does improve improve survival uh, and improve survival for patients. I guess the other important consideration is that triple negative cancers are more likely to be in patients with BRCA1 mutations. And so if your patient is young enough and the cutoff age at the moment is 60 years, um, these patients during, uh, if they are found to have a BRCA1 mutation, the addition of a PARP inhibitor will also improve treatment response. And another group of TNBC patients, if they are if they have the if they have the PD1 and T 
uh, ligand, they actually will benefit from addition of prembrolizumab. And so it is important in these patients where uh, additional benefits can be added on with improved uh, targets um, that chemotherapy is considered as a primary treatment rather than as the adjuvant after an operation. And so this is just a study that was actually published quite a while ago and this looked at what is the prognosis of patients depending on their responses to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And what you can see in the blue, uh, blue box is that if you had complete uh, pathological response in both the nodes as well as in the breasts, your local recurrence failure rate at 10 years is about 6%. If you had some disease left in the nodes, but you had PCR in the breast, then the failure rates go up to 8%, not a big difference. If you were node negative after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but you had some disease left in the breast, um, the recurrence rates at that time, at 10 years, would be 10%, and so still not very large. However, in the group of patients who did not complete, who did not achieve complete response, and so they had positive disease left, either in both in the nodes and in the breast, and actually one in five of them will have a relapse within. Good afternoon. So we will just have to um, interrupt for a while. So we will have a poll for for the questions. No? When is the best time to do sentinel lymph node biopsy on early breast cancer when neoadjuvant chemotherapy is planned? Okay. You may answer yeah, either before and after neoadjuvant chemo or is after neoadjuvant chemo or before neoadjuvant chemo or during neoadjuvant chemo. If you listen later, this will be answered by Dr. Ching. Okay. Okay, thank you. Majority of our respondents says before neoadjuvant chemo. Okay, we will have the answer later on with Dr. Ching regarding the best time to do sentinel lymph node biopsy if we are going to do neoadjuvant chemo. Thank you. In 10 years. So with the group responses that have been seen after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, changes to how the axilla is now managed has have also been starting to take place. And so, what we so if you look at these few trials that were studied purely as outcomes from um, chemo from the outcomes of new adjuvant chemotherapy, what were secondary outcomes that were noted was that patients um, a significant proportion actually did go from being node positive to node negative and. As you can see, it ranges from just under 20% to almost 40% that had then note negative after chemotherapy. And so then, of course, we started to ask, is it possible to avoid uh, clearing the axilla for such patients? And then the next question to, to ask is, who can we avoid this in? Um, and so initially, before we even decide all that, it then becomes a question of when do we do the sentinel nodes? Do we do it before or after the new adjuvant chemotherapy? And there's certain advantages and disadvantages to both methods. If we did it before the new adjuvant chemotherapy, it's definitely more accurate 
um, because it allows you to decide upfront before chemo goes in what stage your patient is. Um, and so possibly it can act as a selector tool to push patients for chemotherapy upfront. The, the cons against this is that it means that there are two operations, one operation before chemotherapy and then your final definitive therapeutic operation after chemotherapy. And because this, the lymph, the central, sorry, and because the axillary uh, stage is determined at the sentinel node biopsies, if they were positive as, at the sentinel node biopsies before chemotherapy, you will automatically clear the axilla at the time of definitive surgery after chemotherapy. And this actually results in unnecessary clearances for one third of patients who would have downstage to no negative disease with chemotherapy. And so the other possibility is do we then do the sentinel node biopsy after you are doing chemotherapy? The good thing is that it's just one operation. You would detect patients who downstage to no negative disease and so you would be able to avoid an axillary clearance in them. However, it is less accurate because you are not sure at the start of chemotherapy if your patient really is node positive or not. Um, and to a certain extent, this may result in a dilemma as to whether patients will require subsequent radiation at the end of at the end of treatment for better local control. Okay, so before we even think about when it should be done is how easy is it to do? And so the, there were actually a few studies that looked at how feasible and how accurate it was to do a sentinel node after chemotherapy. And this is just a summary of them. And you can see that the rates of identification actually ranged from 70% up to 100%. And the false negative rates as well range from 0% to 33%. And certainly identifying the sentinel node only in 70% of patients, and if you had a false negative rate of 30%, these are actually not very good outcomes. And, and so this, resulted in central notes after neoadjuvant chemotherapy not being done for quite a while. Um, however, this study was then published in um, the Sentinel. This is the Sentina study and they actually went into assessing formally how easy it would be and when would be a good time to do your central nodes if patients are planned for chemotherapy up front. And so they had two groups of patients. Um, first were patients who were clinically node negative, uh, but because of disease biology um, and, and then were planned for new adjuvant chemotherapy up front. And then there was another group who were clinically node positive as well. And so the clinical, the group that had no negative disease at presentation were all subjected to a surgical sentinel node biopsy at the beginning. And then they were then either pathologically node negative or they were path pathologically node positive. The node negative group at sentinel nodes would go through new adjuvant chemotherapy and at the time of their formal operations for a cancer, they did not go through a lymph node dissection. And this was group A. In the group that had positive lymph nodes at the central node biopsies, they proceeded to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And then they were subjected to a sentinel node biopsy followed by an axillary dissection. And this was group B. So the next group of patients were those that presented as no positive patients up front. And they were then uh, planned and uh, went through neoadjuvant chemotherapy. However, this group, some of them would actually convert to node negative disease. And this particular group were then subjected to also central node biopsies, followed by an axillary clearance. And this was group C. And in patients who were node positive at presentation, remain node positive after chemotherapy just proceeded to have a formal axillary dissection at the time of surgery. And so this 
than was group D. And so the outcomes from the Sentinel trial actually showed us when uh, sentinel node biopsy should be done. And so you can see that in group A, where sentinel nodes were done at upfront, um, and so without chemotherapy and without any previous surgery, the node identification rate was extremely high, 99%. Group B was the group that had two sentinel node biopsies. So they had the first sentinel node biopsy before chemotherapy, and then they were subjected to a second sentinel node biopsy at the, at the time of definitive surgery before a formal axillary dissection was done. And in this group, you can tell that the identification rate was extremely low and poor, 61%. And again, the false negative rate was extremely high, so one in, one in two. And so it was actually not a very accurate staging at all. And so what this group B tells us is that we should not be doing sentinel node biopsy before chemotherapy because it actually does make finding the sentinel node by sentinel node after chemotherapy almost impossible and the results are not very useful at all. However, the arm C, this is the group that were node positive at presentation went through chemotherapy and then became clinically node negative after chemotherapy. This group had sentinel node biopsies and a formal axillary dissection after that. And in this group, we were able to locate the sentinel nodes in 80% and the false negative rate was 14%. And so this actually suggested that if we were going to have patients go through chemotherapy and we suspected that they would likely get a downstaging of the axilla, it is better to, to only do central node biopsies after chemotherapy. Okay. And so from the Santina trials, these were the other results. Um, and they looked in detail at what affected the false negative rates. And so firstly was the mapping technique. If you only used a single tracer, uh, you were more likely to get a false negative uh, assessment on your lymph node. However, if you use dual tracers, then this false negative rate went down to 8.6%. The other factor that also affected the accuracy of the central nodes were the number of lymph nodes that you removed. So if you only find one, you actually have a one in five, one in four chance of leaving positive nodes behind and inaccurately accessing the axilla. If you only had two, bio, two lymph nodes, this drops to about one in five. However, if you have at least three or more, then your false negative rates go down to 7%. And so currently what is recommended is that if you are doing central nodes in the new adjuvant setting, you should be using dual traces and you should find at least three lymph nodes for assessment at the time of formal of frozen section. Okay. Um, and so subsequently, once those results were published, uh, various institutions and centers then set up their own uh, trials assessing the accuracy and um, and outcomes of sentinel nodes biopsies for patients undergoing new adjuvant chemotherapy for node positive breast cancer. So this was a phase two trial and it was conducted in 2009 to 2011. So the chemotherapy regimes at those times actually are quite a little bit different from what we are using now. And they accepted a whole range of disease patients, so T1 to 4, N1 to 2, but all were non-metastatic. Um, all had new adjuvant chemotherapy, mostly anthracycline, cyclophosphamides, and texanes, and then they all had central node biopsies with axillary clearances. Um, so they compared also certain observations. And so clinicians noted that there was clinical response, complete response in about 83% of patients. However, on final pathology, this dropped down to 41%. However, very nicely though, it showed that um, centers were able to find the sentinel nodes in 92% at least of patients. And, but 80% of these patients all had it allocated using the dual tracer method. And so this was again established that dual tracers are important when we're looking for sentinel nodes in this particular setting.
So when you did, again, they analyzed the results for false negative rates and again, single method sourcing, single use of tracers resulted in false negative rates of 20%, whereas dual tracers actually brought this false negative rate down by half. And again, the number of sentinel nodes removed is important to, to decide um, how much disease or how accurate your node uh, assessment is. And again, they also showed that at least three, but possibly more lymph nodes for assessment brings your false negative rates down. And so predictors of um, response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, because this is how we then, as surgeons, choose who we would push to go for chemotherapy first, or whether we say that, okay, no, it's okay, we can go ahead with your operations first. And so what we do know is that if you have HER2 positive disease or triple negative disease, you are more likely to have an PCR in the axilla um, as well, and the rates are different between the groups, but they're still very high. What we do know is that uh, hormone positive disease is very poorly responsive to chemotherapy and there is less than 10% auxiliary PCR for these patients. Uh, invasive lobular carcinomas as well also respond very poorly. Um, and there is some suggestion that Oncotype TX may be able to predict uh, disease response to chemotherapy. And so hence, you can also use it as a predictor as to whether they are likely to get downstaging of the axilla uh, after chemotherapy as well. Uh, <clears throat> and so how this usually works is that if I have patients that I have planned for chemotherapy up front, um, if they're clinically not negative at presentation, and this is either on clinical examination or radiological imaging, they would uh, automatically be um, planned for central node biopsies at the time of operations once chemotherapy is completed. If they were N1 disease at presentation um, and they appear to downstage to N0 disease after chemotherapy, then we would offer sentinel nodes for these patients. And I'm more likely to offer the sentinel node biopsy if they were triple negative or HER2, HER2 positive disease. Um, for hormone positive cancers, so especially if they're e very strongly ER positive, I prefer to actually do an ultrasound of the axilla to assess the lymph nodes and decide then whether a sentinel node biopsy is reasonable for them. Um, and so if they are, um, so if we do do a sentinel node biopsy for these patients, um, I also make it a formal point A, we use dual tracers. B, we get three, if not four, lymph nodes, and all of these lymph nodes have to be negative on frozen sections in order to avoid the axillary dissection. Um, if I do not find enough lymph nodes, so if I find only one or two, or I see that there are abnormal cells in the frozen section, and abnormal cells may be atypia, uh, ITC, uh, micro or macro mats, then um, these patients, I would proceed and do a formal dissection at the time of, at that initial setting. Okay, so as I reiterated just now, so these are my criteria for actually proceeding with the exterior clearance when I, when there is uh, sentinel node biopsies after chemotherapy. We have a second poll. So what is the best treatment for postmenopausal T2, N1, M0, ERPR positive, HER2 positive invasive ductal cancer? A, upfront surgery, then adjuvant chemotherapy. B, neoadjuvant chemo, then surgery, then adjuvant HER2 therapy. C, neoadjuvant chemo plus HER2 therapy. D, upfront surgery, then chemotherapy. <laughs> 
thank you so much. So next, I just want to touch a little bit on about multi-gene panel testing for breast cancer. And um, there have been quite a lot now, quite a few now on the market. Uh, the commonest one actually is the Oncotype DX. Apologies for the typo there. And this is a 21 gene panel. Uh, the other commonly used one is also Memoprint. Less well known is the PEM50 and also the EndoPredict. Um, and all of them actually try to risk analyze and also provide a prognosis of the patient for future relapse. However, for HR, for hormone positive disease um, and HER2 negative, not negative disease, actually the panel of choice is the 21 gene uh, assay, which is the Oncotype DX. And as long as you have a patient who is hormone receptor positive, not negative, HER2 negative, and, your, and the tumor is at least five millimeters in size, it is recommended that you do an Oncotype DX analysis for that cancer as it does pick out quite accurate, um, quite well patients who are at high risk of relapse in the future and who will benefit from additional adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and so this was the most recent trial that came out for the Oncotype DX and this is the Taylor X. There is another trial that is awaiting uh, final results and publication, but that one will only come out in the next couple of years. Uh, and that is the responder trial. But for this particular trial, which is the Taylor X, what it did evaluate was the benefit of adding chemotherapy to hormonal therapy in patients who had an intermediate risk score in the recurrence score. So the way Oncotype DX works is when you perform it, it gives you a score. And low risk is considered 0 to 18. Um, more than 18 to 30 is intermediate risk, and above 30 is high risk. And so low risk patients do not need chemotherapy. High risk patients do benefit from chemotherapy, but the intermediate group was a bit of a gray area, and so the Taylor X was designed to further clarify this group. And so actually it was found that, patient, that if you had an RS, the risk recurrence score, uh, between 11 to 25, there is no additional benefit to receiving chemotherapy on top of endocrine treatment. And the, the, the disease-free survival for patients um, at nine years after endocrine therapy alone versus ke with chemotherapy was very, very similar. Um, and so were the distant recurrence rates and overall survival. But in this particular group, so there was a subset analysis, and if you had a risk recurrence score of 21 to 25 and you were under 50, then this particular group actually did have a benefit from receiving adjuvant chemotherapy with improvements in their disease-free survival. And so for some patients, younger and then intermediate score, you should also seriously discuss chemotherapy with them. Okay. Right. And so now I just want to talk a little bit about genetic risk assessments and the need for genetic testing. And so historically, this was not formally offered to many patients because of high costs. It was extremely labor intensive. And then there was a long wait time, usually a few months for the results. Um, and so because of the costs involved, it was only offered to high risk patients where the utility of such an intensive resource and high costs were justifiable. However, the technology has changed a lot. There is next gen, sequencing and so firstly it is cheaper the turnaround time for results is faster expedited results come out in two weeks uh, the normal turnaround time is four to four to six weeks um, because it's next generation you can also test a panel of genes as opposed to only one or two genes which was what uh, in it or what historical gene testing used to involve and it is cheaper it takes less time um, and so and also there is increased public awareness and more and more patients now are asking do i need to get gene testing 
And so just for just just to note the criteria for testing as in who would be eligible for gene testing is getting longer and longer um, and so personally i find that using an app actually makes this a lot easier there is one app which is called cancer genetics one word as you see at the bottom of the slide by the group from Geisens and thomas's and this actually is a very good um, app it's not just focused on breast cancer but certainly breast cancer is one of the pan one of the groups that it deals with and it it actually goes through personal history family history and you add in all the add in all the points for your patient and then it tells you whether she would or would not benefit from genetic testing okay, and so but these are the panel of genes that actually should be considered when we are testing for genetic mutations um, some are highly penetrant and these are actually significant because these are patients where you may want to offer positive sorry prophylactic surgery for um, for the unaffected breast um, and then the next group in the second group are the moderately penetrant genes and these patients although they do not need prophylactic surgery it is an option for them um, but if anything else they should also be counseled for increased risk of breast cancer and they can be then subjected to possibly uh, more regular screening Called over the that of the general population as well. And so when should we think about sending patients for gene testing? So uh, myself, I send all young breast cancers unless they are triple negative. If they're triple negative, then the cutoff age is 60 years old. Um, and of note is that BRCA1 carriers will benefit from additional PARP inhibitors to their new adjuvant regimes and improve with improved treatment responses. So this is actually a little bit, this is quite important for some of them. Um, and then in patients who have early operable disease, um, some benefit, especially in young patients, so under the age of 40, is that it then allows us to discuss, do they need preventive operation for the normal breast? Um, and if they were actually initially thinking of conservation for the affected breast, uh, and they then turn out to be gene positive, then it would be one argument against saving the breast for them. Uh, and so if we are able to do bilateral surgery at the time of the one at first operation, then reconstruction is a lot easier. Firstly, you can use your entire tram flap or uh, you're actually more likely to achieve symmetry when you do them both at the same time than if you were to plan them and do them separately. The other thing I find as well is that if you find that your patients actually carry a mutation in the P53 or the ATM gene, then you know that they actually have an adverse reaction to radiotherapy and they have a higher risk of radiation-related cancers subsequently. And so in these patients as well, you would not want to do breast conservation for. Okay. And so, however, before you even send patients for genetic testing, you have to be sure that these services are available. So train genetic counselors because it is very important that patients understand what are the implications of their genetic results um, and that what positive means, what does it mean for them, what does it mean for their family, what does negative results mean, and certainly this huge group of variants of uncertain significance. Many patients feel that these are pathogenic and become unduly anxious and so it is important that they understand what this is before they actually then go ahead and proceed with testing and so lastly i just want to touch on how um, the role of the surgeon in management of breast cancer has evolved and what i find is that as you can see treatment changes have been very, very vast and not just in the surgical arena, but in chemotherapy and with all the new agents coming up, it is extremely difficult to keep up to date with all the changes that are happening. And I find having a multidisciplinary team where we meet regularly and discuss patients and how they are managed actually improves patients' outcomes and also improves management for all my patients. Um, and so these are the main members of the team that we, that we group every week. We meet on a weekly basis and discuss all patients who have had a biopsy. Um, 
and so these made up of surgeons, oncologists, um, for medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, my nurse care, my nurse clinicians are also involved, as well as genetic counselors, and occasionally my plastic surgeons will also sit in on the meeting. Um, but it is now recommended that breast cancer is managed by a team. And so if you have to have a team management, all of them have to actually discuss the case and come to a uh, consensus on how best the patient in front of you needs to be managed. Um, it is usually managed by a surgical oncologist, mostly because we are the first port of call that patients will hit um, at presentation. And so it is easier for us to collate and review information that the patient has. And then once we have looked at all the available data, um, the further investigations and then plan of treatment are discussed and decided on. And so the areas I find that actually benefit a lot are triple assessments. So correlation between clinical radiology and pathology. So clinical uh, input is is usually provided by the surgeons, uh, radiology by radiologists and pathology, of course, by pathology. And actually what is essential is the concordance between all three groups. And so if clinical findings are benign, radiological findings are benign, but pathology and pathology is benign, then we know this patient has a benign condition and does not need regular follow-up or further management. I mean, if there's any area of discordance, so if clinically it is suspicious, although radiology and pathology suggest that it is benign, we would still offer excision of the mass because, and we will act on the clinical suspicion. And if likewise radiology suggests it is suspicious, but clinical and pathology suggest benign, we would still also act on the radiology assessment and we would excise the lesion for final analysis. Okay. Um, the other things I find useful is that as a group of surgeons, whether we decide it is feasible to conserve this patient or not, and if it's not conservable, can we actually do reconstruction? What kind of reconstruction do we want to do? Do we want to do oncoplastic, in which case we just use local flaps, or do we want to do total breast reconstruction? And so is it feasible to even conserve the breast at all? Um, and then when medical oncologists are around, they then discuss with us, does this patient really need new adjuvant chemotherapy? And what is the benefit? Um, and also so when we are assessing stage, radiologists help me in deciding whether is this truly metastatic based on radiology imaging. Um, and then if it isn't, how can we best go about confirming it if it is inconclusive from the scans alone? Um, and of course, all the other decision treat that we can make for a patient will also be discussed. And so just to give you an idea of how results are managed, um, so at my MDT, um, if we're discussing patients with benign biopsy results, um, pathology will go through and discuss with us, a, is this atypical, so does it need to come out or no, it is completely benign. And the radiology will look at the images and decide a has sampling of the, specimen, of the tumor or the lesion been adequate, and B, do they agree that the radiological uh, imaging is benign in appearance? And the surgeon then gives the input as well as to whether clinically it is benign or whether it is suspicious. And if all three agree that it is benign, then the patient will be discharged from the service. Um, in the case of a malignant outcome, then there would be inputs from surgery, oncology and pathology. And although the main treatment plans would be between surgery and oncology to decide whether upfront surgery is better versus that of chemotherapy. Um, and in this new and this, in this age when new adjuvant chemo can potentially make such a big impact to patient outcomes, it is very well worth the time and the effort to sit down and decide uh, which would be the better plan because if you have a very good response to chemotherapy you can do less surgery so you may be able to avoid axillary clearance and then you would have lower lymphedema rates and at the same time if you had very nice downsizing of the cancer itself you may also be able to conserve the breast and then that actually helps patients feel more normal about themselves. 
Um, and I think that is my last slide. And so thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this series of webinars um, about oncology management. My name is Ching. I'm one of Okay. Thank you for the very informative lecture, Dr. Chan. To facilitate the question and answer portion, we will turn you over to our moderators, Dr. Ison and Dr. De La Serena, for the open forum discussion. Hi, Ching. Can you turn on your video? Good Thank afternoon. you so much. Thank you. Hello, Francis. Hello, Hi, Doc. Ching. <laughs> Ching. Are you there? Oh, sorry, I've been yeah, good afternoon. I can't turn on yeah. my video. Thank you very much. Oh, Thank no, you, you very much for a very now. good lecture. <laughs> uh, for very informative and very um, um, comprehensive lecture on, on the breast cancer surgery. Francis, you have any other uh, question? Ching, we can't see you. I know, because I have not been given oh, permission uh, to oh, Ruth, start. Sorry, Ruth. You know, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we want to see your face. <laughs> Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, um, see if it works now. Okay, let's try. Okay. Looks like. This. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, Ching, I'll throw the first question. Um, so what is the role of central node biopsy and DCIS? And unfortunately, only the breast surgeons and a few general surgeons do the procedure here. And then what would you advise the general surgeons who want to start doing the procedure? Okay, um, I guess sentinel node biopsies for DCIS, okay, by and large, by definition, you don't need to do sentinel nodes. And so the only reason I would do a sentinel is when I'm doing a mastectomy. And the reason for this is when you do a mastectomy, well, actually when you do operations for DCIS, there's always a chance it could be upgraded and you may find a small cancer inside, all right? So central node biopsies can only be done when the breast skin is intact. And in a situation where you've done a mastectomy and then you find a cancer which you did not see on your biopsy, you are actually in a very difficult position to try and send, find sentinel nodes after that. So that's why if you're doing a mastectomy, you should always just do uh, sentinel nodes up front. This is just in case your DCIS does get upgraded to an invasive cancer. If you've done breast conservation, then by and large, you can omit the sentinel node at that time because um, if you do find you do have a small cancer, when you excise it after your white local, uh, you can go back and do your sentinel nodes after that. And so in a sense, you only then do sentinel nodes in patients who really need it, rather than for all patients with DCIS going for conservation. So you actually save a lot more resources that way. Would it make a difference if you uh, do a core biopsy first or when the patient was diagnosed pre-op by an excision biopsy? with a full, um, full excision of the specimen with no residual calcifications? Um, no, I think, I guess it depends on what facilities or resources you have available. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have uh, biopsies, as in non-operative biopsies available where you are, and you can just only do it by excision, by and large, even if you're excising DCIS, most of the time, your margins would likely be positive. When you go back for to re lesion, you can simply add on your central notes after that. So it's not a huge issue. Yeah. And so actually for the second part of your question where you wanted to, uh, okay, for surgeons who are trying to start central note biopsies, I think it's useful to actually watch a few first. So maybe um, tag on to a friend who's already doing it so that you can actually see it in practice and then you can also see how it works in terms of the logistics and what you should be doing. Um, I realize that uh, nuclear, nuclear medicine and radiocolloids are not readily available in most parts of 
mm-hmm. of the Philippines. And so, can you see more cases? And then, so like blue dye, uh, methylene blue does work. Just be very careful not to inject it too close in the epidermis because you cause a lot of ischemic necrosis. So, you do have to be in the subcutaneous and then maybe a little bit deeper as well. Okay, so that you can see you harm the skin with. Obviously, we use the patent V blue dye, which is also, I know, hard to find sometimes. Yeah, um, you cannot get it. But now. if you were to start it out, I would say that if you haven't done Sentinel Notes before and then you don't really, and you're, it's new in your institution, what you should be doing is plan all your patients for an auxiliary clearance. But as a first, as a forerunner to the auxiliary clearance, you do the Sentinel Notes and then you do a formal clearance. And then you should do that for at least 20 patients. And what you are assessing is whether, A, when, you, when the sample that you've taken out as your sentinel node, are they, is it the only positive lymph node? Or is it the positive? And does your, so if your sentinel nodes are positive, does it reflect that your auxiliary clearance is positive as well? And more importantly, if the sentinel node that you've taken out is negative, is the rest of your auxiliary clearance negative as well yeah okay thank you so much then you can be okay. sure that you're identifying it properly sorry did i get lost somewhere yeah <laughs> okay do i <laughs> so no yeah do you want me to repeat sure. that or no it's no, we're good yeah we're, okay. we're okay. good dr uh, Shawn. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you very much for that lecture. No, I'm I'm look, I'm uh, speaking as a medical oncologist now. So probably I was. Uh, you mentioned about the three trials that you had with this, uh, the the Z11 and the Amaros, and then you have those Sentinel lymph node bio uh, positive, and then they were uh, randomized to uh, axillary lymph node dissection. And all those studies, they say in the axillary lymph node dissection, when they have actually additional around mm-hmm. 25 or 32 percent in some of the studies that have additional lymph node positive. And then mm-hmm. why is it in that trial, they don't have any differences in terms of the recurrence rate and in, uh, in, the, uh, in overall and disease-free survival? Is it because of the the uh, characteristic of the tumor or is it just because they are a good risk from the start? Okay, I mean, okay, so theoretically all these patients were good risk patients yes, simply because yes. they were clinically not negative. Mm. So if anything, at the most, they would be stage two. Okay. Yes. okay. Um, the other thing about it is that, okay, most of the cancers as well was small. And so if you look at, although they said that they would take cancer sizes up to T2, so up to about five centimeters, if you go by the definition. The median size of the cancers that came out were usually T1. So usually about 15 mm to 20 mm. So 1.5 to 2. So far and much small, lightly node negative, and so no, low nodal disease burden, so early stage. Okay. They didn't, I think they did not distinguish between subtypes. So there was no, uh, they did not say only ER positive and they did not accept triple negative. They took all comers from that regard. Um, but what was important and, uh, and what has always been pointed out as the reason why local recurrence rates and the disease C free survival as well as overall survival remain pretty similar between both groups was because a lot of the patients had um, systemic therapy. And so if you look at the Z11 and also at the Amaros and the other European study, which was the IBC group, at least 90 to 97% of patients had systemic treatment. And systemic treatment does not just mean chemotherapy only. Mm -hmm. Um, It it could be chemotherapy, endocrine. Um, However, there was probably about a quarter of them that only had endocrine treatment as well. And so that was the main, that was also emphasizes the importance of adjuvant systemic after this particular, if you choose to leave lymph nodes behind, you must be sure your patient will go on and accept systemic treatment, whether it's just hormonal therapy, plus or minus chemotherapy. If you think that some of your patients are likely to uh, refuse, and in Singapore, we do have patients like that. And so yeah. 
when I'm actually, when I get my sentinel note come back positive on table, mm. and then I just, I, I just take two minutes and I think, will she go for chemo or not? Or will she take tablets? And if I know from the start, no, she's not going to do it or she's going to try her best to avoid it, then I will still proceed and do an auxiliary clearance. I understand. Okay. We have lots of uh, questions on the board. <laughs> yeah, you, you want to ask uh, the first question, Francis? Okay. The first question, Ching, is that for discordant results, ERPR, HER2, key 67 before neoadjuvant chemo and after neoadjuvant chemo, what, what do you follow? And do you repeat even the biomarkers post-chemotherapy? Ah. So, because in Singapore, we pay for everything. Um, and assessing biomarkers is not really, it's not that cheap for us as, mm -hmm. as an institution to do. So by and large, uh, we actually do not repeat the biomarkers if we've gotten it on the core. The only time we repeat biomarkers on the core would be when... Um, the HER2, actually it's not even a repeat, we actually just go on and do additional testing. So if the HER2 is equivocal on your immune histochemistry, or both are still equivocal, then at the time of surgery, when I remove the whole specimen and then they have a larger sample to do formal testing, then we would repeat the biomarkers then. Okay. We also do not repeat um, biomarker tests when there has been neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, the only time when we would repeat the biomarkers in, in patients who've already received treatment is if they stop responding. Mm -hmm. And so say, for example, I mean, the easiest thing in terms of concepts to think about it is, okay, you have a metastatic patient, you've put her on treatment, and then she just continues to progress no matter what you throw at her. And then you should reassess the biomarkers because did you get them wrong? Because most, most of the time in that situation, you've done a core. So in a sense, your sampling has not been, you don't have a, a large amount of sample to do proper testing. And so it is reasonable to repeat it then. The other time when we... We've treated her properly. And then there is a very early recurrence. And then we would repeat the markers again at that time because we don't know whether, is it a new, something new that has happened or did her markers actually change? Okay, yeah. thank you. Here, we have another question from the poll. Uh, this is from one of our surgeons. The patient, if the patient achieves pathology complete response after new adjuvant chemo, do you still recommend further treatment like chemo and radiation? Okay, so in a sense, it depends what you've done at the time of your operation. And so if you have a pathological complete response and you've performed a total mastectomy, uh, okay, <laughs> some of my radiation oncologists would still offer chemo uh, radiation therapy. And that is because based on the initial lymph node status, at the beginning. So if they thought that lymph nodes were heavily involved at the outset, or if the starting cancer was mm. uh, T3 or above, they would still want to do radiation. Um, but in patients, if you've done a wide look, also you've done conservation, and most of the time, a lot of these patients actually would be very good candidates for conservation therapy. Because after the new adjuvant chem chemotherapy, you can't feel the lump, you scan it, you can't see a lump, and then you've just done a white local at the targeted area, then you would need radiation for the remaining breast. So that is standard as usual. In terms of chemotherapy, no, we do not give further chemotherapy if there's PCR. However, if she's ER positive, then yes, we will continue and give her endocrine therapy. Hormonal treatment. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, um, the third question is for... Grade three tumors, um, which we know has a high risk for recurrence, would it change um, the surgical management plan? Would you offer a mastectomy instead of a lumpectomy just because a patient has a grade three tumor? No. So I. So, yeah. I mean, I always find, and it's very difficult, and, and a lot of my patients find it difficult to accept as well. The the aggressiveness of the cancer does not need to dictate the type of operation you do. Mm -hmm. And so if you have an aggressive, if you have a grade three 
triple negative cancer, but it is small. So it's under one centimeter in size. You know that you can safely conserve the breast and you can get it out with nice margins. Mm -hmm. You can still conserve the breast. Yes. Uh, and and, oh, and it also and what you do in the axilla, so you may have planned her for an axillary clearance. But again, what you do in the axilla also does not need to influence what you do in the breast. So the breast is the cancer must it must be possible to remove it with margins, and you still have a nice amount of breast volume left behind that you can remodel, reshape, so that the breast still looks normal. Uh, you don't have any deformities in it. Yeah. Okay. We have another question here from our medical oncologist. So, good afternoon. Any experience with lumpectomy followed by a high-dose RT versus lumpectomy followed by the conventional RT? Which one is better, do you think? Okay. Could... Can you tell me what high dose RT uh, is? Does that mean high dose? Uh, sorry, conventional RT with a boost. Boost, probably. Okay, so um, the, if it is a high grade cancer, or if the margins are a little bit close, a uh, real cautious will offer to boost the tumor cavity after conventional RT. Um, but my radiation oncologists actually are pretty conservative. So by and large, they tend to boost rather than not. <laughs> Although having said that now, we are also starting hypofractionation. And so hypofractionation means larger fractions, but um, fewer exposures. And so that uh, we are also trying to cut down the number of exposures. Because with COVID, uh, the radiation machines were overbooked and the uh, and they found too many patients. So they were also trying to use shorter regimes as well. But most of the time, they would boost if they did think that it was going to be high risk. Okay. Can I follow up? In, in terms of the Amaros trial that you have, that, that there is a, the same uh, uh, this local control and uh, overall and disease-free survival with radiation treatment, oh. axillary radiation treatment, compared to further axillary lymph node dissection. Uh, would you recommend an RT, uh, axillary lymph node, can be done in, in lieu of the axillary lymph node dissection? Um, yes, if you were only, if you only obtain a small number of positives yes. uh, lymph node uh, at the time of I your sentinel node biopsy. And so the qualifier is still, so most of the time, if you are thinking of trying to avoid a clearance, the number of sentinel nodes you remove should at least should be at least three. three. Because if you take three and then all three are positive, you know you should clear the axilla. If you yes. remove three and then two are two only two are positive, then yes, you can consider to leave your axilla behind. And um, and so my radiation doctors actually for that particular situation where we are, we would kind of look um, it was a high-risk lesion and we didn't clear the axilla. Mm. Okay. I, I'm sorry, Chingwan, we lost you at that time. Can you repeat? Oh. Yeah, can oh, you repeat that? Okay. Yeah. So when would we do axillary RT if we had positive lymph nodes? Um, so the first thing is make sure that you only have two positive nodes during your sentinel node biopsy. So always three. biopsy find at least three, okay? Yeah. Uh, once you've established that, then yes, you can omit radiation. Uh, sorry, you can omit the clearance. And my radiologist will give axillary RT, particularly for high-risk patients. Mm. And so these would be grade three, um, triple negative, HER2 positive cancer. If patients who, who's to match the Z11 criteria, so you had small cancers, extremely hormone sensitive, and you had done a white local, and you were giving chest wall radiation, not axillary, yes. okay, and they only had two sentinel yes. nodes positive, those you do not need to give axillary RT for. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So, so I guess if you that the 
the various trials kind of cover different patient groups. And sometimes it's easy to get lost in the whole mess yes. of information. And it's just to remember what the criteria were for each trial and then see where your patient fits in that particular huh. group. And, and then it would be easier to decide then. Yeah, I understand that all this trial, when you explained earlier about the different trials, now I understand. Okay, Francis, you have another uh, question. We have a question from your uh, breast surgeon, Dr. Guzali. When you do core, uh, when you do core biopsy, um, do you always put the clip, especially those uh, for those mm -hmm. planning new adjuvant treatment? Do you clip the breast and the nodes? And after you do a lumpectomy, do you still put um, liga clips on the lumpectomy site? Mm -hmm. Yes, so if I know up front that patients are going to likely need new adjuvant chemotherapy, and so we do still have women coming with bigger cancers, and you know that you will probably push for chemotherapy regardless of the subtype, then I will request that the lesion be clipped. Um, we don't tend to clip lymph nodes because it may not always be we don't, we do not, yeah, it's not very easy sometimes. And we do not routinely biopsy our lymph nodes as well. We tend to decide as a team whether the nodes look suspicious on radiology or not. There's another question here. Uh, with physical examination. Um, but yes, and so after, at the time of operation, when I've removed the clipped area, I will leave clips behind just to mark the cavity so that the radiation doctors can go back and irradiate the place. If I have done a mastectomy, I tend not to clip the, the area of the tumor unless I was a little bit uncertain of my margins posteriorly. And then, because if my margins are a little bit close or focally affected, uh, RT will help me boost that area if I've clipped it. So, mm. uh, uh, Ching, we had a question before in our um, conference. Uh, if you have a post mastectomy patient, you have close margins posteriorly on a small tumor, T2 tumor, would you advise radiation treatment? Uh, I think most centers will accept if if you've done a mastectomy and then you're close either anteriorly or posteriorly, posteriorly. you've actually, yeah, both, uh, you've cleared it all, especially if you know you've gone down to the prepectoral fascia. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I would not boost it. Mm. Okay, yeah. I think we have there a last question a... from Dr. Usson, yeah. Yes, uh, you mentioned about the next generation uh, uh, sequencing and also the uh, genetic testing on, on patients. Uh, do you routinely do this in patients with triple negative breast cancer, with young women with high risk factors criteria? And do you do this before the surgery so that you can offer a probably a prophylactic mastectomy on the contralateral side? Yeah, so routinely, actually, all ladies who come to us with breast cancer, we will do genetic test for. Um, certainly, if they're triple negative, the age goes up. Mm. So if they're under 60 years old, that is also, they will also be candidates for this. By and large, if they come with an aggressive cancer and they are young, we usually do tend to push them for new adjuvant chemotherapy. And one of the reasons that is so as well is because when they're young, they don't fall into our screening population. And so they tend to come with cancers that are a little bit bigger anyway and will benefit from neoadjuvant. So it actually gives us, the, the neoadjuvant chemotherapy time gives us time to do the genetic testing. And then the results will be available and I can use them when I'm counseling patients about the surgery that they need. We have done um, expedited testing. Although they were aggressive cancers, but they were actually small and they could still do upfront breast conservation. And in those, yes, we, we expedited it just to see whether it was safe for her A to go for breast conservation uh, and, or whether she needed a prophylactic mastectomy on the other side. That's the reason when you say it can buy time for because before the surgery, you may have neoadjuvant or waiting for the uh, results.
Mm. You do die. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have lots of questions yet, but but of course it is time is going uh, <laughs> uh, out. And, uh, Francis, do you have any other uh, comments or question? Um, no, uh, Kim actually has a question, but I, I need to confirm. We'll text you. <laughs> so this has been a very productive afternoon once again. The second webinar by the Facebook Ads Institute for Petal Soccer Hospital. And I'm very thankful to Dr. Chan Ching Wan for gracing this afternoon. Uh, she couldn't have so eloquently and comprehensively delivered this afternoon's talk as she did today. So thank you very much, Jane. And see you on October 10, next Saturday, for the palliative lecture by Dr. Noreen Chan, also from the NUS, NUH. And on October 17, for the psychosocial lecture for healthcare workers from Rigel Tan of Las Vegas. So have a nice afternoon, everyone. Keep safe. All right, thank you for attending this afternoon's webinar. Once again, we'd like to thank our sponsors for making today's event possible. So for our the sponsors, we have OEP Philippines. We have Mundi Pharma, Bio Onco, Sandoz, Good Fellow Pharma. For our gold sponsors, we have Mylan and Calbe International. For silver sponsors, we have Camber, Hetero, and Novartis Oncology. And for our bronze sponsors, we have Detoxicare Philippines Incorporated. Special thanks to Roche. We had a very productive session reminding everyone of our next webinar schedules. Keep posting for any updates. Thank you once again and see you next week. Stay safe, everyone.